Let us look at the Word of God today. Today's Word of God is Matthew 6, 9, Romans 8, 15, and 2 Corinthians 1, 3. First, let us read Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Second Corinthians 1 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Amen. And now our senior pastor will come up and preach with the title, God, our Fa Abba, Father. And so starting from today till next week, I will, I will be preaching with the title, God, Our F Abba Father. And then after this, I considered what sermon to preach after this one. And, you know, there might be some short sermons like this in between, but uh, then I have to go on to a new sermon called Know Yourself. And I think it's going to be about the spirit and the soul. Because I also was curious about the spirit and the soul for a very long time, but I had no way to know. And uh, Pastor Kenneth Hagin's book in uh, the characteristics, the human nature of mankind, and he wrote about that and talked about the spirit and the soul. And he's such a spiritual giant, so I thought my curiosity would be solved uh, in that book. And so I was uh, very eager and excited about it. But uh, unexpectedly, that book uh, did not understand and satisfy my curiosity on the spirit soul. And so afterwards, even though I was very curious, I, I thought it would be something I could only know after going to heaven. But thankfully, through God's grace, I was able to understand uh, the spirit and the soul. And when I preach on it, you'll understand. It's almost like a fantasy novel or watching a movie. That's how mysterious uh, and the relationship of the spirit and the soul is and how mankind was created and how our spirit and soul operates. God was uh, showed me and allowed me to understand this in detail through the Bible. And it was uh, allowed me to prove this through the Bible as well. So I'm very excited and um, was moved by it. But now a lot of time has passed since I received this revelation. You know, I had to preach on um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, etc. So now I think our members might have lost their excitement because they have, um, you know, been exhausted while waiting. So they might not be as curious. So I, I'm worried about this. But uh, Pastor Kim said that this is not something that we can lose our curiosity for. And those who are nodding right now, thank you for nodding. And so we want to g gain our strength again to preach on this spirit and the soul in the new year. So I hope you expect great things. It's going to be exciting and fun. And you will, you know, be relieved uh, of all burden when you listen to it. You know, you only know about how to become uh, human, but you don't really understand what humanity is when the humans are made up of one's flesh and spirit and soul. And so I hope you expect, uh, are excited for this. But today, there are three main passages today, and it's on with this title, God, our Abba, Father. God is the creator of all creation. Through his word, all creation was created. And, you know, you can believe this simply if you want, or you can have doubt over this. But God created all creation, the heavens and the earth. And later when I um, preach a sermon on evangelism, it will help you then. But uh, it is the truth that God created all heavens and the earth. He is the creator God. And because he is the creator God, that is why he is the one true God. Right? There's only one earth. 
Right? It's it's not like Buddha and God and Allah made it all together with God. It's God Himself. There is no other God ex apart from Him. And so we believe that God is the one true God. And you know, other religions, you know, they say, oh, to say that only Christianity is true and all other religions are idols, they say that it's... Um, you know, it's narrow-minded and intolerant to say so. But that's not the case. This is the absolute truth, right? Because what Buddha says, what Allah says are all completely in contradictory with one another. So they can't all be true. And, you know, people, um, even though they're not true, people say, oh, I can believe whatever I want. I can idolize whatever I want. If that's the case, then we should have all religion disappear. That's completely a con. And so only God is our one true God. And that's, that's more the truth than any other religion. And so God is our creator, and that is why he is the one true God. And because of this, God is the absolute sovereign. And this is the kind of God God is. He's the creator, the one true God, and the absolute sovereign. But this God is also holy. God is completely holy. You know, these kind of people who have this much power, they're usually not holy. Right, if they have this kind of power, like we saw through uh, the family of Kim Il-sung, um, they're not holy. But God is the creator God, the one true God, absolute sovereign, and he is holy. And so for us, this is an issue. Because God is completely holy, but we are sinful. And so we cannot help but be uh, demolished, shattered in front of God. But what's more incredible is that God is a God of love. And so God created all heavens and the earth. God is the one true God. God is the absolute sovereign. And, you know, the seraph angels fly and praise him and say he is holy, holy, holy. And even though all of this is true, if this is where it ended, we would have no relationship with God. We wouldn't be able to grow close to him. There would be no relationship. But that's not where it ends. God is love. And so the most important thing about God is that God is love. And so that's why the Bible says God is love. That's recorded twice. And so because God is love, he has a relationship with us. Because God is love, he is our father. And because if God was not love, he would not be our father. He would just be our judge. He would only be our judge. Because the judge and the father are extremities, right? But because God is love, even though God is lifted up high and holy, he has become also our father. But what's unfortunate is that fathers are all not great, right? There are some uh, awful and eccentric and peculiar fathers, right? If we look in the news today, there are fathers who do horrifying things that we cannot even talk about. And so I think it's because we're living in the end times, you know, even animals love their, their children, but there are so many weird and strange mothers and fathers. And so the perception of the father God might be distorted because of these earthly parents. And so to say God is our father, this is such an amazing, wonderful blessing, but people don't know this and they might not be able to um, enjoy it fully. And so I want, and I, I know that we need our perception of God the Father to become different. And so to not be that scared servant, but instead to be that child who is loved fully, to be able to say in front of God, Father or Dad, right? If you're older, you say Father. If you're younger, you say Dad. And that you're able to run to God, that you're able to run to God, to be embraced by God, that you need this relationship. Romans 8 15 for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom you cry Abba father so if you are children then think about your father that you love the father that loves you most fathers love their children so think about that or if you are a father think about your own love for your own children Right? Think about how much you love and care for your children. If you do so, then you can see what kind of person God is.
And you will be able to know this right away, that God is this kind of person and that God is a thousand million times better than that kind of love. That is the God. And this simple method is something that will be able to completely transform your perception of God. This is something that really helped me. You know, what kind of person is God? How do I love my children? Right? What kind of heart do I have for my children? And I was able to realize and be touched by this. Wow, God is this kind of God. You know, God is someone who loves me even more than this, who cares for me even more than this. God is truly my father. And that was able to completely change my perception of God. And so because this is so important, I want to explain this to you until next week as well. So first, repeat after me. God is really our father. And so this world, word. Uh, God is literally our father. This word literally means that it's really our father. So God is literally our father, not just by name. He truly is our father and we need to believe in that. And so there are uh, three different dimensions of how God is our father. First, God is the father of all creations as the creator. Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 3 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And so, why is God our Father? The Father is the Father, right? Why is our Father our Father? It's because He's our root, our origin. So, we cannot exist without our Father. In the same way, if the Creator God does not exist, then everything is empty, void. There is nothing in space. Because we have the creator God, that is why we can exist. And because the creator God exists, that's why all of these creations exist. That's why Paul said this in Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. And so when you meditate on God's word, you see how amazing it is. God is not like three or four people, God is one, the one true God, right? There is only one God in the world uh, that is the true God, even though there are many religions that say they're gods. There is only one God who created the heavens and the earth, and that is the true God. And the true God is one. And so God is one. That is why he is the father of all. He created all. He is the true God. And there's only one of them. And so after understanding this, I was able to look at the Bible differently. And so I picked a couple Bible verses to show this. In verses 41, it says, Who provides uh, the young ones, um, the raven, cries out to God for help. And so usually baby ravens should be crying out to their mother, right? But in the Bible, it says that the young one cries to God for help. Right? Why does it cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Who provides for the raven its prey? Right, Psalm 104, right in here, it, it says, um, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. God's busy, not only ravens, but also he has to uh, look after the lions. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works, and wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Verse 24, verse 25. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. So not only in land, but all the animals in the sea as well. They are all looking to God to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. That's what it says. This is all the truth, right? Starting from plankton, that's that's their most basic thing that people eat. The the God who created plankton is, is God. And it's God who created that many plankton. And then it's God who created the next step and the next step and the next. God prepared all the food to eat. God is the one who created it all. Psalm 145. Uh, 15 to 16, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And so what kind of person is God? God is someone who satisfies the desire of every living need. 
Psalm 147, 8 to 9, he covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes, look at this, right? God is creating all the food for people, for animals to eat, right? He covers the heavens with clouds so that there is rain that can come. And so that because of the rain, the grass can grow, right? So that the beasts can eat their food. Right? He prepares it all. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. There are a lot of young ravens in the Bible that come out. Right? I don't know why there are so many young ravens that come out in the Bible. Matthew 6. It says, look at the, uh, the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Right. And in Luke 12, it also talks about the sparrow, right? Think of the sparrow, but we're going to skip it because it came out a lot. But if we go back to Matthew 6, 28, it says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, right? They're just playing. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes in the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? So why does God do this? It's because God is the Father. It's because God is the Father of all. God is the Father of all. Right? We look at the lilies, right? Even one of the lilies is clothed in such a manner. Right, the uh, birds are not uh, farming; they still are able to eat. They are still able to eat the grass, and the lions of the land and the fish of the sea were all given things to eat. They were provided for. God is the one who created and organized and worked in this manner. God is the Father of all, and that is why He is caring for all creation. And the reason why the earth has deteriorated this far is because mankind has become corrupt. If mankind did not become corrupt, then there would be nothing that eats other things, right? God would continue to let grass grow, and animals would continue to grow. And later, you know, lions would run around with young lambs. Like it's written in Isaiah, like the prophecy in Isaiah, right? No one would devour one another. God would provide for the raven, for the lamb, for the lion. And everything would be beautiful. And even inside the sea and the hills and the land, you know, I, there's no need for me to fear, um, right? The, the mountain pig, the mountain boar, there'd be no uh, need to be scared of them. Right, because wild pigs, uh, pigs can be cute, you know. You know, I was so uh, shocked that wild pigs could be cute, but that's how we can live. And, you know, nowadays people are only worried about development, so there's no need to, um, you know. And so all of uh, nature has been ruined. But if mankind did not become corrupt, it would truly be a paradise on earth, not only for mankind, but for all creation, for all animals and plants. And so as it is written in Romans 8, everything will be restored when Jesus comes again. And we will be able to see how good of a father God is. You know, God truly is a good father, not only to man, but to all mankind, right, to everyone. God is truly a good father. That is what we will be able to see. And that is what we will be able to um, check. Because that is paradise. And that is, is heaven. Do you believe this? And so that is why God is the... Uh, to say that God is the father of all mankind is true. God is not only our father. And you know, because of mankind's corruption, uh, there's this is why there's so much uh, corruption in uh, uh, creation. But when Jesus comes again, everything will be provided for, everything will be cared for again, not only for man, but for creation as well. There will be no death, there will be no uh, hurt, and uh, I hope that all of us will be able to go into this, uh, into this heaven. So second, God is especially the father of all mankind. Paul first talks about how God is the creator God. And through this, he gives evidence that it's not only for all, kind, uh, or all, uh, for all but that 
Uh, everyone is the son of God. Acts seventeen twenty four to 29 The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our, your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. And this is something that was said to the non-believers, to those idol worshippers. They're saying that God made the world and everything in it. He made from one man every nation of mankind. That's why he says we are indeed his offspring. We are God's offspring. So how can we idolize gold or, or, or and serve these other uh, idols? We need to be serving God. That's what Paul is talking about here. And so every person is an offspring of God. And so this offspring uh, is genos in Greek, and it means son or successor. Everyone is God's successor, is God's children. And so ev God is the God of all people. He is the father of all people, not only in creation, uh, not only in this manner, but uh, because of creation. So God is the father of all mankind. He's He's the father, not only of all creation, he's also the father of all man too, right? And so that is why God is the father of all man. Because parents uh, beget uh, children that are like them. And so why does God say we are the offspring of God? It's because man was created in a special manner, in the image of, uh, of God. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. If you look here, it says God created man in his own image. And so what's the purpose of that? To subdue the earth. What that means is to be there instead of God, to be the substitute of God, the steward of God. Right, so they need to be like God in the image of God. That's why man was created in God's image. But God is is a uh, uh, God, right? Uh, Pharaoh and uh, Caesar they used they used to say that they were the son of God, and they used to say that they were God. But God created man in His own image to be instead of Him, and so man, humans, in some ways, are the sons of God. They were made in the image of God. In Psalm 8, uh, David wrote this beautifully. He said, you have made man in w worthiness of you. And what's really amazing is not the heavens, the stars, or the, uh, the moon, but uh, a man. And, and the uh, crown was not gifted to the sun or the moon or the stars, but to man. And that is what made us worthy. Right? What does this mean? It's that mankind and humans uh, and creatures are different. I'm not talking about evolution. What I'm talking about is that cr uh, creatures and humans are completely different. You can't evolve into it. Right? Humans are worthy. Different from creatures. And they were made in the image of God to subdue the earth. Right? That's what it says here. And so what subdues the earth? Is it the lion? Is it the elephant? Is it the whale? No, the land, the sea, whatever is the case, it's the humans who have subdued the land, right? And that's what God created man to do. And you can see the difference between creatures and man. Uh, in our house, there is a dog named Somi. Uh, it's a dog, not a human. 
yesterday while I was preparing for the sermon, I went back home and I met someone for the first time in、uh, the elevator on the way back up and they uh, uh, said hi to me. And、uh, these days, there are a lot of people who ignore my greetings, you know, and it feels really awful, right? You know, it's possible to say hi on the elevator, but there are a lot of people who won't even accept that、um, greeting. But these two couple, this couple、uh, greeted me very nicely. So I thought, oh,、uh, it's, is it possible to have these kind of nice people in my building? This is a rarity. And I was、uh, shocked. But then later, they asked me, they said, are you by any chance Somi's family? Because they saw、uh, the number of the floor that I、uh, pressed. And they asked, Are you Somi's family? And, the, and he said, I'm Ringo's family. Or, sorry,、uh, that's a different house. I'm, I, I'm Leo's family. That's what they said. We're, we're Leo's. And I said, Oh, hi, yes, I heard a lot about Leo. Because my wife talked about Lingo and the Leo and.、Uh, And I, so I said, Oh, yes, I heard a lot about Leo. And, and then I thought in my mind, What am I doing? <laughs> and so I started greeting them, and then we went up. And so our Somi is very happy. You know, uh, uh, a dog's lot is the happiest lot, it's the best lot. He,、uh, she has two servants. And you know how diligent her servants are is that no matter how cold it is, No matter whether it's raining or whether it's hot, at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. And when they go outside, they、um, go for at least a minimum of an hour, an hour to two hours, they, they、uh, exercise her. And they do it at least twice a day. And so, wow, I, I didn't know that they were so diligent.、Uh, Pastor, do you not do it? No, I don't do it. I am not a servant of, of, of a dog. I am the servant of God. So I have, I have a standard to keep. I can't be the servant of a dog, right? And so they, she lives with two loyal servants. And you know, after exercising, even after they went outside, they still play with her inside. They, they you know, throw the ball to her and they call her pretty and beautiful and they、uh, embrace her and not only giving her food, but they also wash her poop and wash her and do everything for her. And they also give her snacks. And you know, during lunch,、uh, after first service, I, I talked about Somi. Uh, a little bit, and、uh, my wife told me something、uh, incredible. She said that it was Somi's birthday recently. And, and because it was her birthday recently, they gathered all the dogs and they had a dog cake and they had a festival for her. Wow. She is loved so much. So when I look at Somi, I think she's so cute, right? And she follows after me well. But when I look at Somi, sometimes I think this thought is it okay for a dog to be this satisfied and live like this? Is it okay for a dog to live like this? Is this right? But there is one more dog in our lives, right? In my life.、Uh, on my way to the, the retreat center,、uh, there's a farm that、uh, raises cows, but there's one big dog there as well. But.、Um, I have never,、uh, this was the first time I ever interceded for a dog. But it was during the summer, and the sun was so hot, but the dog is left outside like that. And so that dog is basically living because it can't die. And it, it stays outside in that heat all day. So when I look at that dog, I am in distress looking at that dog. So I asked the owner, please don't do that. But the owner would not、uh, change. And so every single time I had to pass that dog, I would be parched looking at that dog. And I would be in distress. And so I interceded for that dog. You know, because even though I asked the owner to change his ways, he wouldn't change. So I, I prayed to God to, for the owner to change their ways. That's abuse. You know, I think there needs to be new laws in place because that, those kind of people need to be put in jail. You know, they need to be true hum humans and not like that. And so nothing would change or improve. So every time I looked at that dog, my heart ached for it. And so I was thinking about what I could do. So, you know, when I uh, uh, ate 
for a week, I would gather things for the dog to eat. You know, if anything is left over, I would gather it all together. And I gathered it. And then whenever I went to the retreat center, I would give it to that dog. And so that dog, you know, I thought it, I, I thought it was uh, uh, almost dying, you know, because there was no point uh, in living for that dog, right? That, so that dog is always just like looking outwards at nothing. But nowadays that dog is alive again. So whenever I go now, uh, he knows our, our car sound. Even in the darkness, he knows that it's our car. So when he hears our car, even though he can't see us, he starts leaping in joy. He's like excited. It's not even our dog, but it's, it wags its tail so hard. And it's a very big dog. It's a very um, intense, uh, a fierce dog, ferocious dog, but it, it, it gets so excited. And even if someone goes that's a stranger, it's a, a associate pastor that they have never seen before. It's like joy to the world. Um, the Savior has come. Let all the earth rejoice. <laughs> right? He, he loves um, us. And so the dog now has a reason for life. Twice a week, there is a human who brings me good food. And so, beloved, this is uh, showing us why creatures, how creatures live a miserable, wretched life, except for Somi. You know, dogs and, and cows. Oh, these creatures live a wretched life. You know, maybe in America or in New Zealand or Swiss, there, the cows there right, in Denmark too, right, they have amazing pastures that they can feed in, but in Korea, they have tiny, tiny little farms, and they give, uh, you know, like, uh, wilted grass to them, and then they kill them, and then we eat them for meat, yes, we still need to eat meat, I think it's delicious, but, but, uh, but uh, there's a difference in how they raise these cows, right? There needs to be a bit more freedom. There needs to be a little bit more life in their lives. And there needs to be less um, abuse when they kill them. And then when, they kill, when we kill them and we eat it, we can be thankful. So I feel bad for the cows in our country. You know, we love, uh, you, know, you know, we really like crabs, right? And, and there are a lot of people who love uh, sushi, I'm not a fan of sushi as much, but there are a lot of people who love sushi, but uh, those fish, even before they're dead, sometimes people uh, skin them alive and their eyes are still watching us. And I went to a sushi place last time, but you know they could see us eating their, their flesh. And so this is because humankind has become corrupt and depraved. And so these fish are also abused in this way and they're suffering because of us. What I'm trying to say is this. But why do we live like this? How are we able to eat and be fed and clothed and live in a good house, right? We're about, uh, able to have leisure time and go on vacation. We're not, you know, tied down like dogs are. Why do we live like this? Because we are created in God's image. We're not better than dogs, by our own strength. It's because God created us. When God created us, he created us in his own image, as his stead, as his agents. Uh, in other words, as the sons of God. And that's how God created us, to be worthy. To live a different life from dogs and, and beasts. We live a completely different life, right? And so that's why we are the offspring of God. God is not only the father of all, but especially the father of mankind. And so he has this special love for us. And he is our father in this mindset. Third, God is especially the father of believers. John 1, 12, 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so those who believe in God are the children of God. However, we are not the true sons of God, like uh, the only begotten son, Jesus. We are the adopted sons, right? We see that in Romans 8, 15, the spirit of adoption as sons. And in Galatians 4, 4 to 6, it talks about the adoption as sons, that we might receive adoption as sons. So we're not the true sons, right? There's no need to receive that. So we're the, we receive the adoption as sons. 
And so we are God's adoptees. And so there are orphans in this world. Right? They don't have the parents who love them and care for them. And it's an unfortunate life. They live a life suffering. But if that uh, orphan is adopted by good adopted parents, then his life will completely change. Their fortune, their destiny completely changes. And it's something to be thankful for. And so I talked about this before. God created the heavens and the earth. And as the father of all, he takes care of all. Right? He takes care of the sparrow. He takes care of the lilies. He takes care of the fish. He provides for all of them and feeds all of them. And later, when the end times come, and when the second coming comes, he'll Make sure everyone, all is satisfied, even th so that insects are satisfied, that the grass is satisfied, that the beasts, the creatures are satisfied. That is heaven. Amen. And on top of that, God created mankind in his image so that we can, uh, uh, we can imagine this life that is different completely on a different level from what creatures enjoy and we are able to enjoy this life and third because we believe in jesus when we receive that authority as his children then god's god's uh, kingdom is our kingdom right it's different from living a different life from the creatures now how we will be able to live like god we will be able to be holy like god we will be able to live like God and live in this glorious manner and live forever with God. This is what we get when we become the adoptees of God. And so this is an amazing privilege and something to be thankful for. But even though this is the case, because God is not our our blood father, some our biological father, sometimes we think that we are treated differently than his biological son because we are not we are just the adoptees right like how um some parents might care for a biological child differently or the adoptee differently right even though they give the same things maybe their heart is different sometimes we think these thoughts right we might have a prejudice against god because earthly parents do that so when we are the children of god sometimes we can have this prejudice however even though God adopted us. The focus of that is not that we are adopted. The focus is, is that now we are sons. We used to be sinners, but now God has called us the sons of his sons. That's the meaning behind this. The meaning is not that you are adopted and not biological. That's not the meaning behind these verses. Amen. When God adopted us, it means the focus is on becoming sons, not that we are adopted and not biological sons. And so when we look more deeply in the Bible, we will be able to see that we are not only adopted sons and daughters, but instead we're different from the earthly adoptees. If you look carefully in the Bible, we see that we're not just adopted. This is what's amazing. God actually birthed us. We're not just adopted. But later, when you read in the Bible, it's recorded in there. Right? It says that we are born of God. Right? It explains, it uses these kind of descriptions, but also more as well. We're not just adopted. God actually birthed us. Right? And uh, for humans, only the mother births us. Right? right? Our moms birth us, but we don't have spiritual mothers, right? We don't have a spiritual mother. We just have a, fa a father. And so our father births us. You know, our father, God, the father is not a, a God of uh, earthly fathers, but the father of spirits. Hebrews 12, 9. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? And so, Man is birthed uh, through his mother, but we only have a spiritual father. So our spiritual father also gives birth to us. And as it says here, he's not our earthly father. He's the father of spirits. And so when he gives birth to us, he doesn't do it with his body, but he does it with his spirit. And that's written in John 3, 5 to 8. Well, Jesus answered 
truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so what is the Spirit? It is the Spirit of God. And God is the Father of spirits. And so he births us with his Spirit. But God is also the Trinity God, right? And so when it says that he births us with the Spirit, it's saying that God birthed us because it's the Trinity. It's the same meaning. And so therefore, God is not just our adopted father. We need to throw that thought away. We are his adopted, but it's talking about us becoming his sons. It's not that God is simply only our adopted father. He is our real father. And God did not only give birth to us with the Spirit, but also with the truth of the Word. James 1, 17 to 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the Word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so this is recorded in the Bible, that God birthed us. He brought us forth. And so how else did God birth us, not only with the Spirit, but with the word of truth? And so that's why Peter said this in 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. That's how it's recorded. But because of this, we might think this thought. You know, our mother had us in her stomach for nine months and, you know, she went through the torture of giving birth to us, of life and death. And so, you know, she can't help but love us. But isn't God different? Right? It says he birthed us, but isn't he different? You know, he just brought us forth by the word of truth and by the spirit. Isn't that a little different than when a mother gives birth? But this is a very ignorant thing to say. Because in order to give birth to us, to question whether God suffered more or mother or mother suffered more is is something that is incomparable. In order to give birth to us, who suffered more? God birthed us with the word of truth and with the gospel and with the spirit. What does this mean then? What is the gospel from? Right, the gospel is not just a theory. It's not saying this and this is the gospel. That's not what it is, right? The gospel, in order for it to come to fruition, the begotten son had to come on the earth. And that son had to bleed on the cross and die on the cross. That is how the gospel was created and formed, right? The spirit was, uh, helped us be born again because of what all of this happened. And so to be born again through the Spirit and through the word of the tr truth was only possible through the begotten Son. And so God suffered an unimaginable pain in order to birth us as his children. It is incomparable to the suffering a mother goes through. And when God allowed me to realize this, I was truly shocked. Wow, God truly is my Father. Just as my mother is my true mother, God is truly my father. Amen? God is truly my father. God is truly our father. What is the bigger love? What is a greater sacrifice? Right? A mother who went through birth or a father who had to look at his son dying on the cross. Is God a selfish person? Does he not care about his son dying? No. When his son is dying on the cross, what was the f heart of the father? Can it be compared to the heart of Mary? God, why, uh, think about why God had to ignore uh, Jesus. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Why does Jesus cry out like that? Because the father had to turn away. The, the sacrifice of the Father God cannot be compared to the love of a mother. The sacrifice, the suffering that God went through cannot be compared to that of a mother. You know, many years ago, starting from many years ago, when I started praying for my children, I always prayed that my children will never go through illness or suffering. Because when I see my children getting hurt. I cannot stand the pain. 
I experienced it once when I was a child, uh, when my kids were a child, when they had to um, be hospitalized, you know, just thinking about that, just even going through that was torture. So that's why I pray, Lord, may every illness, every accident uh, be May my children be protected against all accidents and all torture and all illnesses. Because I cannot even imagine, and I can't even imagine my children having to go to hell and being tortured in hell. So I always pray for the salvation of my children. You know, I've heard that looking at ch your children suffering is a seven times, sevenfold the suffering that you would go through yourself if it was you. But you know, think about what Jesus went through. Right? He was um, he was nailed to the cross, and he was whipped, and that nail was so strong. Right? It was so big in order to nail the feet and the hands to this wood board. Right? Think about a parent looking on to their children going through that suffering. But God did this in order to make us His children. This is what He did. And that is the cross. Amen? This is uh, the, the labor pains that God went through is the cross. Nothing can be compared to that. And so God truly is our Father. There's one thing that I was curious of for a while ago. Starting from a while ago. You know, to give the only begotten son for his enemies is something that I could not understand, right? This love is something that exceeds the knowledge of mankind because we can't understand this, that he would give his only begotten son for his enemies. And so that is why we say that God's love is amazing. But on the other hand, we might think, how can he do this? Although it's something to be thankful for, to the Son of God, to Jesus, isn't this something that is too much? Isn't this uh, this too much? How can he give his own Son for his enemies? And this can seem incredibly grotesque. Is this a right thing to do? We might think these thoughts. And although I am thankful for the cross, when I think about the way that he did it, and I'm very thankful for it, sometimes I ask these questions. This is right. Because it, it looks like it might not be a right thing to do. But I was curious of this. But one day while I was praying, this is what he taught me. God taught me about this question. He said, if you think with man, your thoughts are right. Because if a, if a human gives their children for their enemies, that's a crime. Right To love your enemies is not more important than loving your children. right? That's not your duty as a parent. That's different. However, God is not like this because God is God of the Trinity. God is the Trinity. God is not three but one. And so because of this, that's why Isaiah said that he exists forever. And Jesus says, those who see me see the Father. And so the Father, the Son, and the Son are different from the relationship between the Father and the Son on earth. You know, I, no matter how much the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father, they are Father and Son. But the Father and Son, Jesus and God are different. They are completely one. The sacrifice of the Son is the sacrifice of the Father. And the sacrifice of the Father is the sacrifice of the Son. And the suffering of the Son is the suffering of the Father. They are one and the same. And so God is the God of the Trinity. And that's why Paul wrote this in Acts 20:28. 20, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. You know, Jesus is the one who bled on the cross, but God says he obtained with his own blood. And so the uh, Father, the Son, and the Spirit, this one Trinity is one. God is one. He is three in one. And so when you explain it like this, that's when you can understand it. When man gives their son for their enemies, that's wrong. But because God is three in one, and God and Jesus... There is no selfishness in between the two 
and they're of one. And so to sacrifice, the sacrifice that God created is truly amazing. And that's the same sacrifice that Jesus made. And so that's what I was able to understand. So to summarize, although it is right that God create, uh, adopted us, he didn't just adopt us. He also uh, was the one who gave birth to us. He gave birth to us through the spirit and through the word of truth. So he is not just our adopted father. He is our biological father as well. And so Jesus, like Jesus, although he's not our biological father like Jesus, God is our true father as well. Amen. God is really our father. God is our true father who loves us more than my mom loves us. Who is more our father than our earthly father. Who loves me more than my earthly father does. That is who God is. Do you believe in this? He really is our father. That's what we need to realize and believe in. And that is how we need to do our faith life. Second, repeat after me. The father loves his children terribly. So I just explained that God is not just our adopted father, but our true father. And he, uh, 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 he is like our, our biological father. He is like that. He is our true father. And I did this in order to uproot your wrongful thoughts that, uh, you know, just because God is our adopted father, he won't love us as much as a biological father would. You know, there are people, there are people even of this world that love their adopted children like true parents. So God, wouldn't God be more so like this? And so God chooses us as his adopted sons and daughters and gives us the right to the heavens and loves us so much. Wouldn't he love us more? And so that's a wrong thought to think he wouldn't love us as much as he would love his biological children. God is not someone who only gives us the right to heaven, but does not love us enough or love us as much as he loves his biological children. We need to throw away that kind of thought. You know, circumcision and, uh, and these, uh, an uncircumcision has no power, but it is, it is love that is expressed through one's faith that has power. And so we have love uh, for our neighbors, for our children, for our enemies. These can all be expressed differently. But it's that we love because he first loved us. As it's written in First John. We love because he first loved us. So love begets love. Love, the God who is love, is the origin of everything. And because God is love, and he truly loves me, and because he loves me so much, when we don't realize how much he loves us, and we think whether well, we are just adopted sons, that he, he will just send us to heaven, that that's it, then can we truly love God with all our hearts and mind and strength? Can we love God? And can someone who does not love God love one another? And can someone who does not love one another love our neighbors? And can someone who does not love their neighbors love their enemies? These are all connected and from God's love. We need to realize God's love first. And we need to be sure of God's love and accept that love. Amen? That is the root of everything. That is the spiritual root that will allow this love of God to completely come into us and be received and enjoy it and that's how we can live with it and that is how we can love God and have that fruit grow inside of us does this make sense that is how we can love one another and love our neighbors and love even our enemies that is how that fruit can come inside our lives and so that's why God is love and we need to realize how much God loves us and it is fundamentally important to know this. We need to realize God's love for us. That the Father in heaven is not just our Father, but it's our Dad. He's our Dad. He's our Abba Father. That is how our fundamental spiritual tornado earthquake can occur. And we can be shaken from the core. And truly change to love one another and love our neighbors and love even our enemies. And that's how we can live our faith life. And so that's why we need to be assured of God's love for us. Because why is the Father our Father? 
Why is the father our father? It's not just because they give birth to us. It's because of their paternal love. There's a maternal love. There's a paternal love. Our mothers are not just our mo mother because she uh, beget us. It's because of the maternal love they give. It's not just that our dad birthed us, but it's because of that paternal love. I think the main thing about a mother and a father is their paternal love. There are a lot of moms, there are a lot of children who don't love their parents. And it's because although they're biologically their parents, they don't have paternal or maternal love for them. Then their children will not recognize their parents. And you'll reap what you sow. You know, their children won't really love those parents. That's reality. And so why is a father a father? Because of that paternal love. You know, animals love their own children. That's why uh, God gave this paternal, maternal love even to animals. And even evil people love their children. Parents, if you're a normal parent, you cannot help but love your children. So how much more will God, the God of love, God the Father who is love, love his children? If animals, if wicked people love their children, then God the Father who is love will love his children so much more. Don't look at yourself and think, oh, God can't love someone like me. You're not the important part in this equation. It's God. God, who is God of love, will love his children. You know, it's not because your children are beautiful or smart or better than other people. You love your children just because you love them. It's because it's your son. It's because it's your daughter. And that's why your heart goes out to them. That's why you care for them. That's why you comfort them. God's love, why do you think that it's, it's going to be less than that? Why do you think it's going to be not as good as that? So you need to be assured that this is how much God loves you, that God loves you. And so, yes, it is few. It, it is a minority. There are some fathers who only think about themselves and who are selfish. You know, I talked about this before. But uh, some, some parents, some dads, go up to the attic when they come home from work. Why? Because they want to eat snacks by themselves. They want to eat chips by themselves. They don't want to give it to their children. They don't want to give it to the wife. So he buys these snacks and goes up to the attic. I think that's awful. He's, he's a little, um, uh, you know, he, he, he's a little slow. He, that's not a real father. But God is not that kind of dad. That's why these words are written in the, in the Bible. Psalm 27, 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will never forget you. God is different from the earthly fathers. Because man and woman fall in love and they marry and that's why they become fathers right fathers don't become fathers because they love you right fathers become fathers because they love their wife right because they love their wife they became a father isn't that true right honestly speaking isn't that true earthly fathers do not become fathers because they love their children already is they find someone to love and because they love their spouse they become fathers. But God did not love his spouse. He doesn't have a spouse, right? God loved us, right? That's who he loved first. Does this make sense? It's not other people. From the beginning, God loved us. God's focus from creation on eternally, God's focus, who is God's focus, right? The Trinity God loves one another perfectly, and then after loving themselves, the main person that they love, astonishingly, is you and I. God loves you and I, not other people. And he's focused on you and I, and he wants to save you and I. That's why he became our father. And that's why God is our father. In 1 John, John 3, 1, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And the reason that we are the children of God, uh, we're not loved by God because we became children of God. You know, the earthly fathers, 
They loved them because they were born and became their children. But that's not why God loved us, right? God has given this, us this love. See what kind of love that Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. But even before we were called children of God, God loved us. That's what this is saying. And that's why this is so amazing. We were sinners then. We were his enemies then. You know, we were unpure then. But God had pity on us. And he loved us. Amen? He loved us. And so that's why he called us children of God. And even before we were made his, uh, his children, when we were still enemies, how did God love us? It is the greatest love. It is the most worthy love. It's not just a compassionate love, but it, with the greatest love and the most astonishing love, he loved us. And that is why we are his children. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. But God did not do this for his friends, but he did this for his enemies. And not only by giving his own life, but he gave the life of his child. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 John 4, 9, in this, the love of God was ma made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest love is this. Right? In order to make us his children, even before we were his children, he loved us first. Not because we are his children, but before we were his children, in order to make us his children, he loved us first. And this love was something that was even hidden to the angels. This is not revealed anywhere. This is the hidden love of God, the greatest love of God, that it was even something that even the angels were shocked by. The greatest love. And with this great love, he loved us. Even when we were not his children, with this great love, he loved us, his sinners. And so with this love, he beget us. And he made us his children. But this God, is there a way that he would not love us? Right? Just because we're a little limited or that we fall, or that we make mistakes, or that we sin. Do you think God doesn't love us when we do these things? There are a lot of amazing, uh, um, faithful believers in our church. But God does not divide first class, second class, third class among his children. You know, we're not, we're not a school. You know, it's not an honor roll. Right? Children have no thing to compare them to, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're handsome or ugly. Children are not a person to comparative, compare to. It's an absolute love that parents show to their children. This absolute love that God shows to you is absolute. God does not compare you to other people. You know, humankind, how many people are saved? You know, do you think God is... Uh, should be interested in us. He should. Uh, you think that he would only be focused on the saints, but that is not the case. This amazing God loves all of us. But it's that people don't believe in this. People don't agree with this. And that's why they don't receive this love, right? Uh, because of the law, they scared, they, uh, they fear God, right? They don't want to go to hell. So they religiously believe in God and that's it. But they don't give all their life. They don't give all their strength and their mind and their soul to be transformed by God. And although man changes, God does not change. Malachi 3.6, for I, the Lord, do not change. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. There is no change. There is no change. He is always faithful. He, for he cannot deny himself. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even before we were his children, God gave us the most amazing love, this love that was hidden even to the angels. He loved us with this love. 
And that's what we were able to see through the cross. But after this, did God's love change? You know, you know, we know that God loved us like this. But sometimes we wonder, sometimes people have the question mark whether God still loves us like this. But it says in the Bible, God does not change. God's love does not change. You know, this love that gave us Jesus on that cross to love us that much. God, this love that gave Jesus and his blood to us. God's love does not change. It does not grow less. It will not become corrupt. It will not become dull. It will not dim. And who, and who is the one who said the following to um, his apostles? Matthew 24, 12. And become lawlessness, lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. It shouldn't be like this, but that's what will happen. Ephesians 6, 24. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. God desires for us to love with our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And so if God desires for us to love him like that, will his love change? Revelations 2, 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. You know, do you think God is different? It will change? This is what God says. So how can God's love dim? Many uh, people's love dim, but God's love cannot dim. God's love cannot be transformed. God's love for us, that first love for us, how can that be forsaken? How can that be taken away? How can God not love us the same as he did before? That is impossible. If that was the case, then these words would not be written in the Bible. This makes sense, right? All law, all commandments were from God, from God's characteristics, from his personality. And if God is not this kind of person, then this cannot be recorded in the Bible. God's love will not dim or grow cold. That is why these words are written and he commands us to do so. God's first love will not change. That's why he condemns those who abandon their first love. Because his first love does not change. That is how God loves us. So we need to believe this. We need to believe in this. God loves you and I. And in a way that we cannot imagine. The greatest love of all. And that is written in the following verse. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. This right here is something that he's writing uh, to describe that we were made his inheritors through Jesus Christ because God loves us. It says here, and God our Father who loved us. You know, God did not only love Jesus, but he loved us. That's what it's saying. In, in other words, it's saying he loves all of us together like this. And then in John 17, 23, this is what it says. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. It says here, so that you loved them even as you loved me. Right, Jesus is saying this, right? You love them even as you love me. He's talking about those who do not believe yet. Right, and of course, to those who believe, he gives that same love. As you have loved me, you loved them. And so God, just as he loved Jesus, God loves us. That's what this is talking about. It's something that's really hard to believe in. That's how amazing this word is. And that's why God gave us Jesus as a sacrifice. If that was not the case, then he could not give Jesus as a sacrifice. It's not that he just loves us. He loves us as he loves Jesus. As his children. You know, maybe in the Trinity it's different. God uh, loves Jesus differently. But as the Father, how God loves Jesus as the Son is the same as how he loves his children. He loves us the same in this manner. This is what you need to believe in. This is what we need to believe in and not forget. And we need to stand firm in front of this word. And so I want to suggest this to you all. 
to especially to all fathers out there. As a father, think about how much you love your children. Think about that. I'm not doing this to condemn you. You know, fathers love their children, except for a few. All fathers love their children. So think about how much you deeply love your children and how much you worry for your children and how much you desperately pray for your children. Think about that. Because that is when you can see what kind of person God is. Think about how much you love your children. Think about how much you worry for your children. Think about how much you care and pray for your children. If you know this feeling, that is the heart of the Father. That is the kind of person God is to us. That is the love and the heart of God towards us. And it's even stronger for us. This is what I did for myself. This is what I did to myself. And that's when my heart to God transformed completely. I know how much I love my children. I know how much I will do for my children. I know how much I pray for my children. So if I am like this, then God, my father, how much more will he do that for me? And so my thought towards God completely changed. Oh, God is this kind of person. Oh, God truly is my father. And to go even further, oh, God, you know, we heard this many times that God is good. God is truly a good God. Do you believe in this? And that faith just completely grew inside of me. Oh, God truly is my father and he truly is a good God. That is how we can have this faith. And that is how this faith, uh, uh, this prayer can be a prayer of faith. And that is how worship can be worship. Amen. And so our thoughts completely change. And so that's why I'm asking you to do this. If you are a father or if you are a mother, think about how much you love your children. Think about how much you care and pray for your children. Because that is the kind of person God is. That God is much more than this. And God is this kind of father for us. Amen? God is a good God. So, you know, there's that praise, right? God is so good. So I hope you're not expecting me to sing it for you. But there are a few people who are going to sing it for us. So let's sing it all together. God is so good. to conclude the message. This is not the full sermon, so I want to end here. And so we need to realize God's love and that God is our Father. He's not our adopted Father. He's our true Father. And how uh, we love our children, that is how God loves us. And that is how we can know that God is the good God. And God is truly a good God. And we need to realize this. And why do we need to realize this? Why is that important? When we look in the lyrics of God gave his only begotten son in the hymn uh, 294, in that praise, we see the reason for it. And so we sang uh, 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 just a while ago, but sing it with more strength. And so I don't want to um, ruin the song. You know, you sing well, but I don't. 
So let's sing it all together, loudly together. Yeah, I say hymn 294, God gave his only begotten son. Knowing God's love and our faith are inseparable. You know, our faith it needs to be a faith that works through this love. And so if we are not sure of God's love, if we don't know God's love, how can we have a faith that works through love? And so our faith, the, the foundation of our faith, isn't that the cross? And believing in this uh, God who has the cross, isn't that the love of God then? And isn't that the assurance of God's love? And so what is the foundation of our faith? It's uh, being assured of God's love through the gospel. Right? There are the um, concepts uh, of the gospel, but the concepts are God's love. Is It's about God's love. Realizing God's love and being sure of God's love. And that is when our faith becomes true faith. And that's when our faith will grow. And that's when our faith will grow stronger. And so we need to be sure of God's love. We need to be sure of God's love. And even if we uh, uh, live 
and we sin from time to time, if we are sure of God's love, we can return to God. Right? Think about uh, David and how when his son Absalom died, who this was the son who tried to kill David. But at that time, David, was he celebrating? No. At that time, he was so lamenting and mournful because it was his son, even though the son tried to kill him. That is the love of the father. Just because we sinned or just because we fell doesn't mean that God stops loving us. God is not that kind of a God. So we need to move away from those kind of thoughts. God um, transcends all of those things and still loves us. Even if a child does much wrong and the entire world points against them, the, the, uh, the parent already forgave the child and is just waiting for that child to return. Right? That person is not going to say, how can you desire forgiveness from me? That's not what they're going to say. When the, the child comes back and th they repent, they will rejoice and be thankful. That is the heart of uh, the parent. And that is the heart of God. You know, what's truly remarkable is that God showed what kind of person he is to Moses. He showed Moses who he is. In Exodus 34, 5 through 7, it says this, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is God. This is the God that we believe in. And so that's why God says that he is love. But it's whether you truly believe that God is this kind of person or not. This is the kind of person God is. In Ezekiel as well, this is what he says. Right? For I have... Right? He's speaking against those who ha have idols. And uh, he's speaking to these people. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. So it shows what kind of person God is. And the greatest person who shows what kind of person God is, is Jesus. And it's in Luke 6, 15, 20 to 24. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to celebrate as his uh, older son said right this is the younger son who used it on prostitutes and on pleasures of this world who was living in sin and then used all of his inheritance and now he had no place to go and this is the son who came back home because he has no place to go but see what the father does and so we must not misunderstand our Father. Even if we sin, God continues to love us. Like Charles Finney said, God's love is a love where he delights in us and he grieves for us. When we are doing God's will, he delights in us. And when we sin, God grieves for us. But delighting in us is because he loves us. And grieving for us is also because he loves us. Just because we sin does not mean that God hates us. He grieves for us. He loves us. He continues to love us. That delighting love and that grieving love is the same love. Depending on our state, God at times delights in us and loves us with that delight. And at times he grieves and laments and mourns for us with that same love. God continues to love us and this love will not change. And so when he first loved us, is not when we were righteous, but when we were still sinners, when we were still enemies. But God, so when we sin and when we make mistakes, do you think God will just hate us right away? That is not the God that loves us. God's love transcends such things. You know, a parent loving their children, doesn't that, isn't that a trans transcending love? A parent 
loving their children that transcends their child. Doesn't matter how they look. Doesn't matter how their children does or how much they succeed. Parent loves them nevertheless. There might be children that are more handsome or more smarter or more respectful or are more successful, but you still love your child infinitely because they are your child. So why do you think that God's love is less than that? That is truly insulting God, if you think so. God loves you with no change in his love. We need to be sure of this. God loves us so much with no change in this love. This love is not from us, and it's because it is from God. This love of his children. This is a love that is from him. It's a love that cannot be contained. It's a love that cannot be changed. It cannot end. That is this love. And that is how he loves us. And I hope you and I live out our faith lives like this. That is when we see that not only will our words change and our actions change, but our hearts will change. Because what God desires is our heart. He says, give me your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. What God desires is this heart. And so your heart will look, go forward to God. And you will give your heart to God. And you will love God with all your heart. I believe in this. That would be the greatest faith that you could have. And you'll be transformed in this way. And I believe that this will happen for all of you. And so at this time, let us pray. Let us remember what we heard today and pray. And let's repent of misunderstanding God. And to give thanks and how much God loves us and to receive this. And as you pray, whether you repent, whether you ask, whether you give thanks, that you can be in front of God like a young child who yells, Dad, who yells, Father. So let us pray in this manner, saying, Dad, Father, in this manner, and embrace in God's hand, uh, arms and receive his love and enjoy his love and to be thankful of this love and to be just drenched in this love, to be transformed in this manner. I bless you in Jesus' name. Let's remember what we heard today and pray. 하나님 감사합니다. 하나님 감사합니다. 우리를 사랑하시는 하나님 감사드립니다. 우리의 진짜 참 아버지 되신 하나님 감사드립니다. 하나님, 우리가 죄인 되었을 때, 원수 되었을 때, 세상의 기준은 사랑할 만한 것이 있을 때 사랑하고 대해주지만. 우리가 주님께 배반한 원수 되었을 때 죄인 되었을 때 어떻게 우리를 극률히 보시고 어떻게 그 자신된 아들을 주실 계획을 세우셨습니까 하나님 오늘 말씀이 성령 안에서 하나님이 어떤 나의 아버지신지 내 영에 파고들게 하여 주시옵소서 하나님이 진짜 원하는 것은 우리가 하나님을 하나님답게 아는 것인데 이 시간 이 말씀을 통해서 하나님의 그 아버지 되심의 실체가 우리 영 속에 파가 들어오게 하여 주시옵소서 세상이 심어준 거짓된 관념들 사단이 정죄하는 거짓된 생각들을 버리고 좋으신 하나님 아버지 상상할 수 없는 하나님 아버지 위대한 사랑을 갖고 계신 하나님 아버지 놀라운 하나님 아버지 그 하나님의 사랑이 우리의 마음에 성령 안에서 깨달아지게 하여 주시옵소서 성령으로 우리를 낳으신 아버지 양자 삼으신 뿐만 아니라 복음으로 그 아들의 피로 우리를 낳으신 하나님 아버지 그 사랑이 우리의 마음을 지금 새롭게 하게 하여 주시옵소서 우리가 하나님 세상에서 죄 짓고 주님 앞에 멀어진 게 있습니까 우리 모시면서 새롭게 하지 못해서 돌보지 못해서 탈직하신 하나님 내 품으로 달려와라 당자가 죄 짓고 세상에 흥천만정 쓰러지고 있을 때그 아들의 향해서 눈물 뿌리고 탈직하셨던 그 아버지 돌아오기만 해라 내 품으로 돌아와야 된다 말씀하셨던 하나님의 그 사랑 그 사랑으로 우리를 보고 계신 하나님 오늘 말씀 선포된 그 하나님의 실체를 성령 안에서 우리가 다시 한번 깨닫고 아빠 아버지 주님 앞에 달려가는 오늘 이 시간 되게 하여 주시옵소서 아빠 아버지 아빠 아버지 나의 참 아빠 아버지라는 시간 부르며 주 앞으로 올라갑니다 저를 내 소망으로 살려 들어갑니다 우리는 어떠한 사람으로 주님이 사랑하여 주셨는지 그 은혜가 어떠한 은혜인지 오늘의 이말
말씀을 들으며 나의 진짜 아버지가 되시는 그 아버지의 품으로 달려 들어갑니다 우리를 살리시려고 나를 살리시려고 그 아들을 독생자를 내어주시기까지 온전히 자신을 내어주신 아버아버지의 그 사랑 갚을 수 없는 그 은혜를 우리가 입었습니다 아버아버지 소금과 성령으로 우리를 낳으시고 그 아들을 사랑하신 것처럼 나를 사랑하신 그 하나님의 품 안으로 이 시간에 달려 들어갑니다 그 사랑 더욱 깨달아 알게 하소서 십자가의 그 사랑만큼 당신의 사랑을 우리에게 확증하여 주신 것이 없습니다 아버 아버지 주의 사랑을 의심하지 않고 변함없이 오늘도 어제나 오늘이나 동일하신 그 사랑으로 나를 사랑하시는 그 하나님의 사랑을 힘입고 아버 아버지 앞에 이 시간에 나아갑니다 주님의 사랑으로 우리를 채우시옵소서 그 사랑을 더욱더 깨달아 하는 마음을 주시옵소서 하나님을 마음을 다하고 목숨을 다하여 뜻을 다하여 사랑할 수 있어 그 사랑을 신뢰하며 나아갈 수 있는 우리 모두 잘될수 있도록 그 아버지의 그 사랑만으로 우리를 이 시간에 채워 주시옵소서 아버지 이 시간 우리를 새롭게 하시옵소서 이 시간 우리를 새롭게 하시옵소서 주의 사랑 평생을 갚아도 갚을 수 없는 그 사랑 주님의 은혜를 우리가 그 무엇으로 갚을 수 있겠습니까 아버아버지 값으로 살수 없는 너무나 큰 대가와 엄청난 상고를 겪으면서 우리를 아버지 성령 안에서 우리를 자네 삼으시고 양자 삼아주신 그 하나님을 믿으시고 신실하신 그 사랑의 하나님을 이 시간에 우리도 그 사랑 안에서 깊이 인식하며 나아가기를 원합니다 주님 우리를 이 시간에 주의 사랑으로 충만케 하소서 이 시간에 우리를 더 주님의 그큰 사랑 안에서 나아갈 수 있도록 하나님 우리를 새롭게 하여 주시옵소서 성부하나님 성자의 일생에 성령 하나님 진심으로 감사와 찬성과 영광을 올려드립니다 우리가 아직 죄인되었을 때 우리가 아버지와 원수되었을 때 우리를 아버지 하나님 사랑하여 주시고 증명할 수 없는 사랑으로 우리를 품으신 아버지 감사와 찬성과 영광을 올려드립니다 아버지 우리 아버지의 사랑으로 부르고 계신 하나님 내 품으로 달려와라 내가 너의 이름을 부르고 있다 말씀하시면서 우리를 찾으신 하나님 우리를 향해서 가슴이 녹고 계신 하나님 
너는 내 것이다 너는 내 아들이다 너는 내 딸이라 부르시는 내 아들의 피로사 너는 내 것이라 말씀하시는 하나님 그 하나님의 사랑 가운데 지금 달려갑니다 주님이 그 아들을 위해서 그 아들을 죽이시고 우리를 그 생명 주시고 우리를 건든 걸 알았을 때 어떻게 세상에 이런 사랑이 있을 수가 있는가 어떻게 이런 놀라운 사랑이 있을 수가 있는가 하나님 앞에 우리의 마음이 높고 회개하고 주님께 달려갔던 것처럼 이 시간 말씀을 통해서 우리를 찾으시고 부르시고 품에 부르시는 그 하나님 앞에 아버지 나의 소망과 나의 모든 사랑과 모든 것을 주님 앞에 향해서 달려가길 원합니다 하나님 이 시간 성령님께서 우리 마음의 아버지의 사랑을 깨닫게 하여 주시옵소서 그 사랑이 모든 두려움을 몰아내게 하여 주시고 내가 진짜 하나님의 아들이구나 내가 진짜 하나님의 딸이구나 그 하나님의 품으로 지금 달려가 주의 사랑을 느끼고 깨닫고 새롭게 결단하며 주의 뜻대로 살고 하나님께 감사하며 사랑할 수 있도록 우리의 심령을 지금 새롭게 하여 주시옵소서 주신 아버지 우리의 심령을 새롭게 하여 주시옵소서 자비의 아버지 모든 위로의 하나님 아버지 우리가 주님의 그 위로 안에서 우리를 사랑하신 그 하나님의 사랑을 믿고 신뢰함으로 나아갑니다 하나님은 우리에게 너무나 신실하셨습니다 우리의 일평생 정세전부터 우리를 향하여 신실하시고 너무나 아름다운 하나님의 그 뜻과 계획을 가지고 계셨습니다 주님이 우리에게 신실하셨던 것처럼 나의 삶도 나의 인생도 하나님 앞에 그 신실함으로 주님 앞에 내 사랑을 보일 것입니다 아버지여 우리의 어떠함에 따라 우리가 하나님의 사랑을 의심하고 신뢰하지 못할 때가 얼마나 많았습니까 그러나 하나님 아버지 그것으로 충분합니다 십자가의 그 사랑으로 목숨까지도 아끼지 아니하시고 우리를 사랑하신 그 십자가의 사랑으로 우리에게는 너무나 충분하고도 넘치는 그 아버지의 사랑을 믿고 신뢰하며 나아갈 수 있습니다 하나님 그 사랑 안으로 더 들어가게 하소서 그 사랑 안으로 더 우리가 하나님을 신뢰함으로 나아갈 수 있는 그 좋으신 아버지로 감사함으로 이 시간에 올려드리기를 원합니다 주님 역사하여 주시옵소서 Lord, we thank you for your amazing love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.